thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Chambers and I serve as the Special Assistant Field Deputy for Los Angeles County Assessor Jeffrey Prang. During today's presentation, hosted by the great Bishop Noel Jones, you will learn pertinent information pertaining to our organization, such as nonprofit non organizations. You will learn about the filing requirements, church exemptions, welfare exemptions, as well as assessments, change of ownerships, um, our new proposition that was just signed by the legislature, Proposition 19, and exemptions, which will include our homeowner's exemption. Our presentation will be given by, uh, host, hosted by Bishop Noel Jones. Bishop Noel Jones is an American theologian and scholar who rose to a celebrity status as a global powerful preacher and charismatic leader. His message forces one to think beyond traditional views of God and spiritually to understand the, mysterious, the mys mysteries of God instead of becoming religious or mystical. His skills in hermetics and homiletics are recognized and appreciated by many of his contemporaries. Moreover, he is known for thinking outside the box and has been labeled elector, a maverick, and a preacher's preacher. His anointing, transparency, and intellectualism have made him one of the most sought after voices nationally and, inter and internationally. He's hosted the California Black Caucus Breakfast and works with many politicians on many levels of government and also serves as spiritual leaders to personalities in the entertainment industry and sports figures such as Tavis Smiley, Chris Tucker, Lorenz Tate, Kim Whitley, Tyler Perry, Bill Bellamy, Reggie Bush, and Corey Maggot. He's the best-selling author of several books, The Battle for the Mind, published in 2005, and best, excuse me, and because of popular demands, the book was re-released, congratulations, Bishop, in 2012 as Battle for the Mind edition. In addition to his work in Christian ministry, Bishop Noel Jones is a business consultant who connects entrepreneurs and investors with global business ventures. This afternoon, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the great Bishop Noel Jones, leader, faith leader, inspirational leader of the great city of refuge of Los Angeles. Thank you, Bishop, for being here this afternoon. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, the question being asked repeatedly around the world as I travel is, the church still relevant in the 21st century world? Can it continue in its present form and continue to exist as a reliable and significant institution to empower change? Is the church spiritualizing the world or should the world secularize the church? Is the church turning the world upside down or should the world turn the church upside down? Uh, Rabbi Zacharias, he says, attacks on Christianity and the church are rampant in today's society. Unbelievers once revered the church and its teaching, but now they scorn them. Films, films such as the Da Vinci Code and our organizations such as Jesus Seminar attack the credibility of Jesus and the Bible. Much of the education in the 60s, I've noted, became unhinged from moral and ethical values. Uh, I read books like Excellence Without a Soul by Harry Lewis. And we've seen it happening for more than 50 years. There is no longer philosophical attitudes. This is a mood that we're in, a mood that now finds its way even to the Supreme Court. So this mood we call secularization. And it now holds that religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. The reason we're here today, and the reason we want to open up the knowledge of what is going on around us and the significance of our churches being a part of what is happening in a sense that we partner with our government. Uh, I remember when I first came to LA, uh, Mayor Reardon was in at the time and he called all of us who were new leaders to sit and talk with him about how we could operate together. He had a marvelous program that was at UCLA, a business program that he wanted for inner city kids, but he just could not find the kids 
that he wanted to find because he didn't have the machinery. The church had the machinery. The inner city church had the machinery. But we needed to find how to get to the information. And so we partnered. That's what we have to do now because there is so much that we just don't know and don't have an insight to. And this is why we're having this webinar today so that the church can be visible, not only in administering the information, but also in bringing the people together to grasp that information. So I am very, very pleased and honored that we have just a great group of people who are going to give us information that we need in such a time as this. And so I now, find it an honor and a privilege to introduce to you the LA Counter, LA County Assessor, Brother Jeff Pratt. Jeff. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop, Bishop Jones. It's really, uh, I appreciate that, uh, that warm welcome. It's really a, a pleasure to be with you today. And I thank you for agreeing to, to partner with us um, because the mission of the church is recognized in, in law and there are uh, uh, benefits in property tax administration to benefit uh, houses of worship and uh, yes. nonprofit organizations. And we are here to share that information with you so that you can make sure not only uh, in, in, uh, in your church, but amongst your fellows who you uh, interact with throughout the community who, who the, the law can benefit we want to make sure you understand what it is and how to take full advantage of the opportunities that uh, uh, the government uh, provides for uh, uh, for uh, houses of worship and, and nonprofits. So um, this is the, our very first uh, uh, faith-based webinar um, of a program that we are calling Ask the Assessor. Um, yes. I hope that I and my staff are going to be able to answer the questions uh, that you might have as, as well as to inform you about the uh, uh, the process of getting church uh, property tax exemptions, um, assessments, uh, changes in ownership, as well as how the new, uh, the new law called Proposition 19, which was passed last fall, how that will affect you and, uh, and your, uh, your, your congregants. Um, but during uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the assessor's office, along with a majority of other uh, county government offices, We've had to restrict in-person public service, including seminars. But with that said, we understand that our educational seminars and services are really vital to the community. And as a result, we've been working very hard on a series of videos and webinars that can be easily accessed by the public. Um, one of the benefits, I guess, is people are home and they're uh, at times bored, so they're paying attention to property tax administration uh, seminars where otherwise they may not. So hopefully more, more, more folks are getting the information that they need. So um, just to give you a, a, a real quick background, here's a snapshot of the responsibilities of the assessor. The first thing I like to remind people is that I'm not the tax assessor, I don't do taxes. Um, the guy who does taxes has a very intuitive title, he's called the tax collector. Um, I'm one of three countywide elected officials. Uh, the other two are much better known than I am, uh, and that's the district attorney and the sheriff. The LA County Assessor's Office is a department of about 1,200 employees. We're located in six different offices throughout the county, and we're the largest local property assessment agency in the United States, responsible for establishing the value for over two and a half million real property and business assessments um, annually, which last year were valued at over $1.8 trillion. On a side note, I wanted to uh, encourage you as well to check out our redesigned website at assessor.lacounty.gov it's gonna include a video of today's webinar, along with a lot of other important property tax related information, such as the latest news uh, regarding Proposition 19. You could sign up for our informative newsletter to let you know about helpful tips if you uh, own property or uh, are involved with uh, real estate. Um, also puts a lot of uh, information about tax savings programs, um, such as the homeowner's exemption that uh, Michelle mentioned, as well as other tips to avoid reassessments and penalties. Um, there's a number of specializations in my department. So rather than me as the department head trying to uh, uh, talk about some areas which it's much more complicated than I know all the answers, 
I have brought a very talented team of professionals from my office who are each going to give you a little different uh, uh, piece of information about different components of our office. Uh, those uh, in the, they're each got their own uh, segment. Uh, we're going to start with Lisa Lucero, who's a, a principal appraiser of what we call ownership services. We also have Brittany Menya, uh, who's an appraiser specialist, and Robert Izazaki, who's a special assistant, and Denny Estrada, who's an appraiser specialist, uh, one uh, from our major exemptions department. Um, so feel free to ask any questions that you may have in the chat area, and a member of the team will reply. So at this point, I want to, uh, again, thank you, uh, Bishop Jones. It's really an honor for me to be with you and uh, thank you so much for uh, helping us put this together. But I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle Chambers, who's also a special assistant and field deputy in our department to facilitate the, uh, uh, the webinar from this point forward. And again, thank you all for attending. I hope the information will be informative um, and uh, hopefully exciting as well. Thank you. LA County Assessor Jeff Prank for that great introduction of our office and the great introduction of our presenters. Our first presenter will be Ms. Brittany Mana of Major Exemptions Section. During this presentation, she will discuss filing requirements, type of exemptions, claim forms, and as well as re re religious exemptions and claim for welfare exemptions. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Brittany Mana. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, in California, all property is taxable unless it is exempt. When I say property, I mean all land, improvements, and personal property. There are two types of exemptions a property could be granted, a full exemption or a partial exemption. When an exemption is approved, it is applied to the general tax levy portion of the property tax bill. When a full exemption is granted, it does not mean that you will receive a zeroed out property tax bill because direct assessments are not exempt and still taxable. Exemptions could be applied to a secured property tax bill or an unsecured property tax bill for your personal property and fixtures. To initiate an exemption, a claim form must be submitted timely. The following period is between January 1st to February 15th of any given calendar year. When an application is received late, the property will receive a partial exemption. It may be subject to a 10%, 15%, but not exceeding $250 late fee. The late fee is collected via the property tax bill, where the exemption amount is reduced by the claim uh, late fee amount. So there are three types of applications available for religious organizations seeking to receive an exemption. Under the Constitution of California, Article 13, a religious organization may apply for a church exemption, a religious exemption, or a welfare exemption. When the assessor's office receives a claim form, it will conduct a field check to verify its use is acceptable under its corresponding revenue and taxation code. The first type of claim form is the church claim form. Under a church claim, the sanctuary, parking, church office, and Bible study rooms is covered to be exempt. The church claim requires to be filed annually. And under a church claim form, it could either be owned or leased by a church. Examples of a non-exempt use uh, would be if you had uh, perhaps retail or commercial space at the property. The next type of exemption is a religious exemption. Under a religious exemption, the use that is exempt is the sanctuary for worship, parking lot, church office, Bible study areas, and elementary and secondary school. But to qualify for religious exemption, the church must be the owner of the property. And with this type of exemption, it does not require you to file annually. Instead, you'll receive a card in the mail 
asking you one question, if everything has remained the same as um, the previous year. An example of a partial religious exemption would be if you um, had a cell tower located um, in the property. Lastly, we have a welfare exemption. Under a welfare exemption, there are various types of organizations that may apply. Um, charitable, hospitals, religious, and scientific organizations may all apply for a welfare exemption. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'm only going to focus on religious organization applicants. Under a welfare exemption, the appraiser will again field check the property and exempt the sanctuary, parking lot, elementary and or secondary school, everything that's covered under the church and religious plus living quarters. The property needs to be owned by a nonprofit church. And if a church is leasing the property, then if the exemption is approved, um, the exemption will be applied to their unsecured property tax bill only. And with the welfare exemption claim, you do have to file every year. And to conclude um, this part of the presentation, I'm gonna show you all three claim forms. The first one here is the church exemption claim form, BOE 262AH. Um, with this one, you do have to apply every year. The second one on the screen is uh, the religious application. And with a uh, religious application, you don't have to follow every year, but remember you'll receive that card in the mail asking you if everything's the same as it was the previous year. And lastly is a welfare claim form. Um, the form number is BOE 267. Um, with the welfare claim form, you, you're also gonna need to attach what's called an organizational clearance certificate. And you obtain that with the State Board of Equalization. Um, you'll also need to attach your financials. And um, depending on how you answer each of the questions, you might have to submit additional forms with this application. Um, but we do have a public service department. Um, the phone number is located on the top right-hand corner of the applications. We're open from Monday to Friday to, uh, from 7.30 to 5 p.m. If you have any questions or need any help in filling out any of these forms, um, thank you. And that is my presentation for religious organizations and their exemptions. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany, for that great presentation. And thank well, you to all the to all the participants who are here today. We see that we're entering the chat. And just so you know, this webinar will is posted, will be posted on our website, the assessor's website. And we are currently streaming live on the assessor's Facebook page. Reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the QA and our staff will be greatly appreciative to answer them for you afterwards. Our next, our next presenter is Ms. Lisa Lucero. She is over our ownership services unit, and she will be speaking on assessment and change of ownership. During this presentation, you will learn about change in ownership, the definition of change in ownership, the death of a property owner, change in ownership exclusions, the penalty for not filing a change in ownership statement, new construction, and decline in value. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our presenter, Ms. Lisa Lucero. Hello, how are you? I think I'm on screen. Anyway, hi. Um, thank you, Michelle. So, um, I'm as Michelle mentioned, I'm going to speak to you about assessment and change in ownership. So, what causes a property to be reassessed? There are three events that will change an assessment on a property, and those are a change in ownership, also known as a transfer, new construction and a decline in value. So I'm gonna to talk to you first about, a new, about change in ownership. A change in, there's the definition of a change in ownership. That's a legal definition. A change in ownership can be voluntary or it can be involuntary. An example of voluntary change in ownership is when a person buys or sells their property with the assistance of a realtor. Another example of a voluntary change in ownership 
is when my favorite aunt decides to move and gifts her property to me. That's a voluntary change in ownership. An example of an involuntary change in ownership is when a property is foreclosed upon or upon a death of a property owner. Because we know people who are deceased cannot own property. When a change in ownership occurs, the assessor is required to go out and reappraise that property at market value, which will become the new base value of that property. And that's typically the sales price. Once that base value is established, the base value can increase no more than 2% every year under the provisions of Proposition 13. Um, so when the market is just exploding and it's going up 4% a year, 5% a year, that base value is only going to increase 2% a year. So how is the assessor notified when a change in ownership occurs on a property? Well, the assessor is notified for most changes in ownership by the recordation of a deed. The assessor will receive a copy of that deed and we will process it accordingly. Any applicable exclusions, we're gonna process that, update the name um, of the owner of record. However, when a change in ownership occurs as a result of a death of a property owner, there's no deed. Therefore, the law does require that a change in ownership statement, death of a property owner, be filed with the assessor's office within 150 days of the date of death or if the estate is probated at the time of filing of inventory and appraisal. And I think a copy of the change in ownership statement, death of a property owner um, is the next slide. Um, when you submit that form, it's, it's helpful and it's more efficient to submit along with that form, a copy of the death certificate, a copy of the trust, a will, any exemption claim forms or letters of administration. And it's really important to file this change in ownership statement, death of a property owner timely. It allows the assessor to process the transfer, update the owner of the property and apply any applicable exclusions. If we are not notified as required by law upon the discovery of this unreported change in ownership, the assessor is required to process the transfer as of the date of death, that change in ownership, and process escaped assessments. And therefore, escape tax bills will be issued. So for example, if a property is held in a trust um, and that trust or the owner of that trust dies, that's a change in ownership because if I'm talking about a revocable trust because upon the death of that trustor or present beneficiary in a revoc in a revocable change in owner uh, trust that trust that trust becomes irrevocable and that's a change in ownership many times we're not notified of that type of change in ownership because the heirs believe that the trust owns a property but that is a change in ownership and i have seen where um, we are not notified in this, in this type of situation. The heirs decide five years later to sell the property. And at that, upon that sale, we discover that the owner died five years ago. And now there are five years of tax bills that are issued in the name of the trustee unsecured. So it's really, really important to fill out that change in ownership statement timely change in ownership, death of a property owner, timely and submit it. Now, are there any exclusions for from assessment when a property changes ownership? Yes. Transfers between spouses are excluded from reassessment. Transfers between registered domestic partners are also excluded from reassessment. And just let me note, because we get asked this quite a bit, are there any exclusions from reassessment from siblings? No, there are not. And my favorite aunt, when she left me her property or gifted me that property, that's not an exclusion either. Um, there are two other exclusions um, that Robert, my colleague Robert Izozaki will 
be explaining, which is under Proposition 19. Um, those are exclusions from reassessment between parents and children and grandparents and grandchild. So Robert, as I said, will be explaining those later. Um, when you purchase a property, you might receive a change in ownership statement. If you do receive this change in ownership statement, it is very important to fill it out and turn it in. Um, within 90 days, and I think that's the next screen, um, within 90 days, um, because there is a penalty for, for if you don't turn this in, and it's $5,000 for properties eligible for homeowner's exemption and $20,000 for property not eligible for homeowner's exemption. So please, please take that five minutes, fill out that form and submit it. And lastly, regarding a change in ownership, it typically takes about four to six months when a change in ownership has occurred to receive a tax bill. And that's because um, four different county departments are in that process. The deed is recorded with the recorder's office. Um, the assessor then establishes a property's value, base value and applies any exemptions. The auditor then applies a tax, the appropriate tax rate and determines the tax liability. And the tax collector will issue the tax bill and collect the taxes. So it does take a little bit of time. So have patience with the county. The next event that will change a property's assessment is new construction. So when a property owner adds onto their home or adds onto their property, say they add a new bedroom to their home or adds that pool or that very, very popular accessory dwelling unit known as an ADU, the value of that new construction will be added to that property's trend at base value. The assessor will only add the value of that new construction. So the value of that new bedroom will be added to the existing assessment. We're not gonna go out and assess or reassess the entire property. So how does the assessor know when there's new construction on a property? Well, when a property owner pulls a permit, the assessor receives a copy of that permit. And many times we also receive a copy of the blueprints. But what about unpermitted new construction? Well, when the assessor finds out about that unpermitted new construction, we are required to assess all improvements on a property. Therefore, upon discovery of that unpermitted new construction, it will be assessed as of the date of completion and any escaped assessments and escape tax bills will be issued. The last event that will change an assessment on a property is a decline in value. A decline in value provides a tax reduction by allowing for a temporary, that's important, temporary reduction in the assessed value of a property when it suffers a decline in value. So what's a decline in value? A decline in value occurs when the trended base value, that base value that was established when you acquired that property, trended no more than 2% every year, that trended base value is greater than the current market value of a property. A decline in value assessment is temporary. When a decline in value assessment is enrolled on a property, on a, on a property, the assessor's office must review the market value of that property annually and, and enroll the lower of the market value or the trended base value. So for example, if a person purchased their property and it has trended no more than 2% every year, it now has a trended base value of 500,000, but the market value took a dive and it's only now worth 400,000. The decline in value assessment will be enrolled in the amount of 400,000. But now in my example, the market just explodes and the market value on that property is now 600,000. The assessor will review the value and see that the market value has increased and we will enroll 
and it restored that base value trend. And we're not gonna review it annually every year. So in summary, the three events that will result in a change in assessed value on a property are a change in ownership, new construction, and decline in value. Thank you very much for your time. And Michelle, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that great presentation. I'm sure everyone is so appreciative of this great information we're receiving so far. I'm getting many comments now with the present, uh, folks that are watching uh, live are saying this is great information. So thank you all. And just a reminder to the participants who are on the day that please ask your question in the Q&A. And after the presentation, our presenters will answer your questions live. So make sure you stay on, keep those questions coming, because we'll surely be sure to answer them after the presentation is completed. Our next presenter is Mr. Robert Asaki. He's over the public affairs uh, division, excuse me, and he's going to address the impact that proposition of the newly proposition 19. Uh, during this presentation, you'll learn about the constitutional amendment that was passed by voters recently. Property tax savings for seniors. This is a major one, so please uh, pay attention. Property tax savings for seniors. Property tax savings from transfer to family members. This is another major um, piece of information that we need to learn is the correct way to transfer property. And also, we will also discuss the impact that Proposition 19 will have on your children and how it may affect your child financially once you transfer your property. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our presenter for this portion, Mr. Robert Iasaki. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so for my portion of today's presentation, I'll be speaking on Proposition 19. Proposition 19 was approved by California voters in November of 2020, and its passage resulted in amendments to the California Constitution. Specifically, it impacted two existing property tax programs. The first, it expanded the base year value transfer benefit for seniors, the disabled, and victims of natural disasters. Second, it imposed new restrictions on parent-child and grandparent-grandchild transfer exclusions. And we also call those intergenerational transfer exclusions. So first, we'll take a look at the changes to base year value transfers. Before Prop 19 came into effect, Prop 6090-110 was the governing law for base year value transfers. Under Prop 6090-110, seniors, the disabled, and victims of natural disasters could sell their home and transfer their tax base to a new home. The new home had to be of equal or lesser value, and it was required to be located in one of 10 participating counties. Also, under Prop 6090-110, such base year value transfers were a one-time benefit. On April 1st, 2021, the Prop 19 base year value transfer provisions came into effect. Under Prop 19, seniors, the disabled, and victims of natural disasters can now sell their home and transfer their tax base to a new home. The new home may now be of any value and it can be located anywhere in the state of California. Finally, under Prop 19, a homeowner may transfer their base year value up to three times. Additionally, under Prop 19, it's worth noting that the market value of the new home will determine the extent to which a base year value transfer will benefit a homeowner. If the market value of the new home is less than or equal to the market value of the original home, the tax base can be transferred without any adjustment. However, if the market value of the new home is greater than the market value of the original home, the difference will be added to the transferred tax base. So let's take a look at an example. A homeowner who is 55 years old sells their home and one year later purchases a new home and it applies to transfer their tax base. The current Prop 13 value of the original home is $300,000. The current market value of the original home is $1.3 million. The current market value of the new home is $2 million. Since the market value of the new home is greater than the market value of the original home, the tax base for the new home is calculated by adding the current Prop 13 value of the original home, which is $300,000, and the difference in the fair market values, which is $700,000.
After going through this calculation, we find that the tax base for the new home will be $1 million. Now, we understand that this equation can be a little bit complicated. So to assist homeowners, the assessor has created a Prop 19 base year value transfer calculator, which is located on our website. All you need to do is enter the AIN or street address of your current home, the market values of your current home and the new home, and the calculator will estimate the tax base of the new home following the Prop 19 base year value transfer. Now let's move on to intergenerational transfers. Before Prop 19 came into effect, Prop 58-193 was the governing law for intergenerational transfers. Under Prop 58-193, transfers between parents and children were eligible for reassessment exclusion. Also, certain transfers from grandparents to grandchildren were also eligible for reassessment exclusion. The exclusion applied to transfers of a principal residence, there was no limit placed on the value of the principal residence transferred. And it also provided for an additional exclusion for the transfer of property other than the principal residence. And that had a $1 million limit. The exclusion had a general three year claim filing period with two general exceptions. And Prop 19 made several major changes to these provisions. On February 16th of 2021, the Prop 19 intergenerational transfer exclusion provisions came into effect. Under Prop 19, transfers between parents and children are still eligible for reassessment exclusion. Also, certain transfers between grandparents and grandchildren are also eligible for reassessment exclusion. Some of the changes, though, are as follows. The exclusion now applies to transfers of the principal residence only. There's also a $1 million limit placed on the transfer, transfer of the principal residence. No other property now qualifies for exclusion under Prop 19. In addition to the aforementioned restrictions, there are also new requirements to claim an exclusion under Prop 19. Within one year of the transfer, the transferee must occupy the home as their principal residence, they must file a claim for the homeowner's exemption with the assessor's office, and they must also file a Prop 19 claim for reassessment exclusion with the assessor's office. Under Prop 19, the market value of a home at the time of the transfer will determine the extent to which an exclusion for, will benefit a transferee. If the market value of the home is less than or equal to $1 million, the Prop 13 value will carry forward without adjustment. However, if the market value of the home is greater than $1 million, a value comparison test is performed to determine whether or not an adjustment is required. The value comparison test states that the tax base moving forward will be either the current Prop 13 market value or the, I'm sorry, the current Prop 13 value of the property or the market value of the property less $1 million whichever is greater. Again, let's take a look at a quick example. A parent transfers their home to their child. The current Prop 13 value of the home at the time of the transfer is $300,000. The current market value of the home at the time of the transfer is $2 million. Because the market value of the home is greater than $1 million, the value comparison test must be performed. Here, we'll take the greater of the current Prop 13 value, which is $300,000, or the market value less $1 million, which here turns out to be a $1 million. So after performing the test, we find that the child's tax base moving forward will be $1 million. Again, this equation can be a little bit complicated. So to assist homeowners, the assessor has created a Prop 13 exclusion calculator, which is also located on our website. All you need to do with this calculator is enter the AIN or street address and market value of your home, and the calculator will estimate the tax base of the home following the application of a Prop 19 exclusion. Now, having completed our overview of the changes under Prop 19, I will now turn to some common questions that the assessor's office has been receiving. First, 
what impact does Prop 19 have on me and my children? So this appears to uh, pertain to intergenerational transfers. So as we discussed, Prop 19 places limits on the kind of property you can transfer your chip to your children along with its tax base. As we know, that is now, it is now only the principal residence that uh, pertains to that exclusion. Also, Prop 19 places a value limitation on the exclusion that can be applied to the transfer of the principal residence, $1 million. Second, how does the implementation of Prop 19 apply to my child financially if I transfer property to him or her? First, it's important to note that Prop 19 will affect different taxpayers and properties in different ways. However, generally speaking, if you transfer a principal residence that is worth over $1 million to your children, there may be an increase in the property taxes that they will be responsible for. Finally, it is important to note that there are a number of questions that are still unanswered with regard to the implementation of Prop 19. The Assessor's Office is currently awaiting clarification in the form of enabling legislation from the California Legislature. But in the meantime, we encourage you to visit the Assessor's Prop 19 webpage, which has a number of helpful resources, including Prop, the Prop 19 calculators, frequently asked questions, and much more. Thank you for your time. And that concludes my remarks on Prop 19. Back to you, Michelle. Thank you, Robert, for that very great informative information on Proposition 19. Next, we will have our presenter from ex exemptions, and that is Mr. Denny Estrada. During this presentation, you will learn about the homeowner's exemption, what it is actually, um, dwelling, unqualified examples, and also our disabled veterans exempt exemption that a lot of uh, community members are not aware of. We have a, a disabled veterans exemption. In this present time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our, our final present presenter, Mr. Denny Estrada. Good afternoon, uh, Jeff, Bishop Jones, and all the virtual audience. Uh, my name is Denny Estrada. I work a major exemptions section, as Michelle just stated. I'm also a veteran of the U.S. Army and retired as a rank of major, so I have a little bit of a, a kind of understanding with the disabled veterans. Now let's talk about homeowners exemptions. California property tax laws provide two alternatives by which the homeowners exemption up to a maximum of $7,000 assessed value may be granted. Alternative number one is the exemption is available to an eligible owner or of a dwelling which is occupied as the owner's principal place of residence as of June 1st, I mean, January 1st of the calendar year that they're applying for. The alternative two is the exemption is available to an eligible owner subject to a supplemental assessment resulting from a change in ownership or a completion of new construction on or after January 1st provided the owner occupies a property as his or her principal place of residence within 90 days after the change in ownership or completion of construction or the property is not already receiving the homeowner's exemption or another property tax exemption of greater value. If the property received an exemption of lesser value on the current role, the difference in the amount between the two exemptions shall be applied to a supplemental assessment. Now, if you're a new owner, you will automatically receive an exemption claim form in the mail. There's no cost to fail, uh, file, but there is a cost not to file. <laughs> to receive 100% of the exemption, $7,000, you must file by February 15th. If you file after February 15th, but before December 10th of the year that you're applying for, you will receive an 80% exemption, which is $5,600. The alternative two is the full exemption up to the amount of the supplemental assessment. If any is available, provided the full exemption has not already been applied to the property on a regular rule or in a prior supplemental assessment for the same year. To be applied, the filing must be made by 5 p.m. on the 30th day after you receive the supplemental notice of assessed value change or new construction. If a claim is filed after the 30th following date of the notice of assessment, a special a supplemental assessment, but on or before the date, the first installment of supplemental taxes becomes delinquent, then 80% uh, exemption will be allowed. 
thereafter, there's no uh, exemption allowed on the supplemental assessment. Now the dwelling, um, uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a place of residence subject to property tax, single family residence structure containing more than one dwelling unit, such as a duplex, triplex and above, condominium or a unit in a cooperative housing project, houseboat, manufacturing home slash mobile home, land on which you live in a state licensed trailer or mobile home, in the cabana of a trailer or mobile home. Now, dwellings not qualified. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Okay, the, the property is not occupied as a principal place of residence. It is or intended to be rented, vacant, and unoccupied, or it's a vacation or secondary home with a claimant. Now, to help you determine your principal residence, if you're still confused, here's some of the factors. A person is physically present and makes his or her home there. A person customar customarily returns after work and between trips or absences due to work pleasure or otherwise, even if the absence is extended. Your clothes or personal belongings are kept there. Household housekeeping, like such as preparing meals, sleeping, bathing, entertaining is set up there. The person files income taxes returns as a resident there. Driver's license is issued there, the, or the person is listed for voter registration. These are some of the things that will determine it, it's, it's your primary residence. Now that, concludes my homeowner's exemption. Now I'll switch to disabled veterans exemption now. The California Constitution and Revenue and Taxation Code section 205.5 provides a property tax exemption for the home of a disabled veteran or an unmarried spouse of a deceased disabled veteran. Basic eligibility, if the disabled veteran who because of an injury incurred in military service is A, uh, blind in both eyes or has lost the use of two limbs or is a totally disabled as determined by the United States Department of Veterans Affairs or by the military service for which the veteran was discharged. They rated the disability compensation at 100% because the veteran is unable to secure or follow a substantially gainful occupation. Also, 100% disability rating or unemployability must come from the Department of Veterans Affairs after filing for a claim with them and not from a personal physician. Now, we know that sometimes government agencies take a long time to get claims processed. I don't include the assessor's office in this uh, in case Jeff's listening, but uh, if the VA finally decides on 100% disability rating and you filed a few years prior and they finally get around to it, the, um, there is a statute of limitations of eight years that we can go and backdate based on a 100% disability date that the Veterans Affairs puts on, uh, on the file. So uh, even if it's three years later after you first filed and it's backdated, we will honor it up, up to eight years. Now the disabled veterans exemption has no personal wealth restriction. The exemption is only available on a veteran's principal place of residence, much like the HOCS or the homeowner's exemption. I'm sorry, no. HOCS is a uh, nerdy assessor talk. Uh, the home may only receive one property exemption. Thus, if a homeowner's exemption has been granted on a property and the owner subsequently qualifies for the disabled veterans exemption, the homeowner's exemption should be canceled to allow for a disabled veterans exemption as it provides a greater benefit. You cannot have both. The disabled veterans reduces a property tax liability on the principal place of residence of qualified veterans who due to the service connected injury or disease have been rated 100% disabled or are being compensated at the 100% rate due to unemployability. An unmarried surviving spouse of a qualified veteran may also claim for the exemption. Now there's uh, court, like just take the slide, there's two levels of disabled veterans exemption. The basic exemption, also referred to as the $100,000 exemption because that's the value that it was when it first uh, got approved by the California Constitution, I mean the legislature. It's available to all qualifying 
claimants. The exemption amount is compounded annually by an inflation factor. For example, for 2021, the basic exemption amount is $147,535. Complete BOE 261-G parts one through three and sign it. Once it's approved, you no longer need to file in perpetuity unless you have a change of residence or a death occurs. Now, the second one is the low income disabled veterans exemption. The low income exemption, also referred to as the 150,000 exemption, is available to qualifying claimants whose annual household income does not exceed a specified income limit. The amounts for both the low income exemption and the annual income limit are compounded annually by an inflation factor. For example, in 2021, the low income exemption amount is $221,304 and the annual household income limit is $66, I mean, $66,251. You must attach an exemption 137 along with the BOE 261G annually and fill out uh, question number four. Veterans benefits such as pension, disability, social security and all living and all the income of all your inhabitants of your home must be included. So if that still applies and you make less for 2021, less than $66,251, you will be eligible for the low income uh, exemption. Now here's what you need to turn in when you first file for the disability. First of all, you get a letter from the United States Department of Veterans Affairs stating that you're 100% disabled, disabled or unemployable, you'll get a determination letter with a date of when this is effective. There, you also must provide a character of service was under other than honorable, a dishonorable condition, such as the DD Form 214 or other letter from the United States Department of Veterans Affairs indicating the character of service. Prior to January 1st, 2017, only honorable and general discharges were accepted. Now it's been expanded. So if you became disabled after that January 1st, 2007 date, it includes all the other discharges except the dishonorable discharge. Now also an unmarried, an unmarried surviving spouse should provide a copy of the marriage certificate and a death certificate if, if uh, applicable. If the veteran did not qualify during the veteran's lifetime, the unmarried surviving spouse must attach a copy of the marriage certificate, copy of the death certificate, or report of casualty, proof that the death was service-connected, and dates of the veteran's service. You can get this from the Department of Veterans Affairs if this applies to you. Now, an unmarried surviving spouse, such as a, a widow of a, somebody who died in service, May, or the veteran had the low income, uh, I mean, the, the, had the basic exemption and, um, and they, and they, just, and they uh, expired, the spouse can reapply under her name. It's transferable, the, uh, the exemption to the spouse. Now, it's for the, in this case, if the spouse gets to keep this benefit provided that she does not remarry. If she does remarry, then she uh, is not eligible for the disabled veterans exemption. However, if she divorces, then she can reapply. Uh, it's kind of complicated, but that's just part of the rules. Now I'm gonna go over some frequently asked questions about ownership. <clears throat> Would you still be entitled to disabled veterans exemption if my wife and and I created a revocable trust where our children hold title to the property as trustees and we are the beneficiaries. <clears throat> yeah, the answer is yes, provided you still meet the other requirements for the exemption, you, you would still be entitled to the exemption. The trustee takes only bare legal title to the trust property and does not become an owner in the normal sense, whereas you and your wife as the beneficiaries have an equitable state in the trust property. Now, is the exemption allowed if a title to the residence is not in the name of the disabled veteran, but is in the name of the spouse? The answer is yes. The disabled veteran may receive the exemption even if the property is owned by the veteran spouse 
a separate property. As long as a veteran's principal place of residence, you would have to provide a marriage certificate in that case as well. Is my registered domestic partners regarded as my spouse for the disabled veterans exemption? Currently for the disabled veterans exemption, the domestic partner is not considered a spouse. Now the disabled veterans exemption reduces the property tax liability on the principal place of residence of qualified veterans who due to a service connected injury or disease have been rated 100% disabled. And, or, but many people make the mistake of, I, that means my house is 100% uh, exempt. No, it's subject to those values that change year to year as we talked about earlier. That's a common uh, question that many veterans that apply, they think 100% means 100% for property taxes and that's not the case. And on one final note, if for both Hawks and for the disabled veterans, the assessor from each county compiles a list of the Hawks and disabled veterans claimants and submits it to the California Board of Equalization. There, they will compile a list to see if there's any duplicates. And then they will send a letter to the applicant saying they noticed something different, which is your primary residence. And they will notify the other counties that they're not, that they're, let's just say they have three homes and they applied in all three. They, the two that they claim are not the primary residence, they'll, they'll notify the counties and they'll take them off the list. And uh, only the list that's a primary residence. That concludes my disabled veterans exemption and homeowners exemption. I give, give it back. Well, I think the, uh, it comes back to me. Um, I think we promised you that we would provide you with a, uh, a program that uh, lasted about an hour. We are right at about an hour. I want to uh, thank everybody for participating. Hope that the information we provided was uh, helpful and interesting. Obviously, if you have any questions, I put my phone number and my email into the chat. Feel free to reach out. I want to thank Lisa Lucero and uh, Brittany Menya, Robert Izazaki, uh, and Denny Estrada for sharing their expertise. I want to particularly uh, acknowledge Michelle Chambers for helping put this together. But most importantly, I want to thank uh, uh, Bishop Jones for agreeing to host this with us. Um, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to partner to provide this critical information to the community. And we know that things are very, uh, you know, some very difficult uh, uh, issues with the family right now. And it's even more precious to us that you would spend a few uh, minutes with us um, uh, while you're in enduring such challenges in the family. And we want to send our, uh, our uh, best wishes and prayers to you and your family as you uh, um, uh, go through this uh, these difficult times. So that concludes our uh, presentation for today. Thank you so much. We look forward to coming back and providing uh, information uh, from time to time. And please feel free to reach out to us if we can ever be of service.